Good evening. Now the government has set out seven conditions that supermarkets have to meet before the resumption of business. You're watching KBC Channel 1 and tonight it's all about matters business on Business Insight. I'm Regina Manyara. Now it is a decade after, you know, we promulgated our constitution and these questions are, what has Kenya achieved in those 10 years and where are the gaps? We're going to be focusing on that in not too long, just to remind you that we are live and we appreciate your feedback. And as far as business is concerned, we're going to be looking at matters of technology. Experts have it that with the adoption and integration that we have seen since Kenya confirmed its first case of COVID-19, that this indeed is the norm for the long haul. Ten years on, what have we achieved? What are we missing? These questions are going to be aptly answered by my colleagues' panel tonight. And uh, you rightfully put it there, Regina. This is actually what we seek to answer tonight. Ten years uh, ago, on a day like this, thousands of Kenyans uh, congregated at the historic Uhuru Park grounds right here in Nairobi for the promulgation of the 2010 Constitution. And this is a document that has been termed as the most progressive internationally because it provided a new dawn for the country promising to address some of the, of the issues that were ailing, uh, were ailing us as a country. Issues to do with historical injustices, issues to do with discrimination, issues to do with our system of governance. Remember, it is this, around this time that we transitioned from a centralized to a devolved system of governance. But 10 years down the line, the questions we are asking, like my colleague Regina is putting, is have we really benefited or have we realized the promise that was enshrined in the 2010 constitution and how faithful have we been in implementing this document that promised a beautiful vision for our country i will be posing some of these questions to my panel tonight in our comprehensive news bulletin that begins right now a very good evening my name is safin aching oma and our sign language interpreter is byron abuli let's kick start with the highlights and we all of us as Kenyans as stakeholders even before we we see what is in the BBI begin agitating for a reduced size of government how has the new constitutional dispensation impacted the lives of ordinary Kenyans divided opinion as Kenya marks 10 years since the promulgation of the Constitution Migori, Governor Okoto Bado and his four children to spend another night in police cells over 73 million shillings for judges. And devastation in Baringo County as floods wreak havoc. Right, welcome on board as we mark 10 years since the promulgation of the 2010 Constitution. We invite your views. Do engage us on social media at Safin underscore Ching and on our official uh, Twitter handle at KBC Channel 1. You can also follow this broadcast on Facebook Live and on YouTube. We begin straight away with our top story. Drafters of the Constitution have expressed their satisfaction with the implementation of the document 10 years since it, its promulgation former chairperson of the defunct committee of experts Nzamba Gitonga is however imploring on the executive to expedite legislation of remaining constitutional bills required for implementation of the constitution. Kevin Washira begins our bulletin. Legal minds under the Law Society of Kenya engage the drafters of the constitution on implementation journey 10 years since its promulgation. Former chairperson of the defunct committee of experts which drafted the constitution Zamba Kitonga, expressing his satisfaction with the implementation process, however imploring on the Attorney General to speed up the remaining constitutional legislations. In particular, during the, the of, term of office of the former Attorney General, he did endeavor as much as possible to ensure that uh, the laws that were required to be amended or reenacted were, were, were done, but uh, this aspect has lost steam in the last five years. 
Um, I think there have been areas of the Constitution which are self-executing and which therefore nobody could interfere with. In respect of that, I think the Constitution has lived up to our expectations. What am I referring to? For example, until 2010, Kenyan women were not citizens. Under the Constitution, we are all citizens. So that's not something anyone could tamper with. The drafters of the Constitution are particularly impressed with the impact of devolution which was introduced by the Constitution with the name of decentralizing power and resources. The legal minds, however, are disappointed with attempts by the executive to violate the principles of the Constitution through disobeying court orders. The appointment of judges has disappointed Kenyans because up to now we have not had uh, the 41 judges appointed so far. There has been uh, disobedience of court orders by the government. These are things that could be done better. Former Commissioner in the Defunct Constitution Implementation Commission, Kamodo Iganjo, noting the Constitution had increased awareness on governance, transparency and equity in distribution of resources. The former Commissioner, however, challenged the Law Society of Kenya to take up the oversight role to ensure smooth implementation of the Constitution. I think that process then needed to have moved to institutions like ourselves, the Law Society and other professional bodies, to own that space and to recognize that it is not in the interest of governments uh, to implement uh, progressive constitutions. And so we shouldn't be surprised that governments are not owners of the implementation process and that that process needs a new owner of professional bodies and other non-state actor bodies, the media, churches, if we truly believe that this constitution is transformative. The lawyers want 27th of August to be officially declared a holiday named the Katiba Day. Kevin Washira, Channel 1 News. And our calls for a constitutional review continue to peak as the country marks 10 years since the promulgation of the constitution. The clergy joining in the chorus for changes to the document are pushing for a reduction in the number of county governments to save the taxpayer from a ballooning wage bill, even as they dismissed talk of creation of new positions in governance structure. Jacqueline Wambiru has details of the calls by the men of the cloth. A decade after the birth of the constitution, religious leaders under the Kenya Council of Church Alliances and Ministries opine it is time for changes to the document. According to the men of the cloth, it is paramount to effect changes such as the reduction of county governments since it has proven to be a burden to the country's economy. This would have been a very good time for us to reduce the counties. We are not interfering with the current jobs of governors, deputy governors, MCAs. But I would be happy that we can say during the next election, we shall have a reduced government. Because the kind of burden that is there right now, that the burden that the, the, the Kenyan ex exchequer is carrying, it is so heavy that by the end of this J June, June this, this year, our domestic debt were at 3.1 trillion. If you consider the external one, maybe you're talking about 6 trillion. So what are we saying? Can we, all of us as Kenyans, as stakeholders, even before we, we see what is in the BBI, begin agitating for a reduced size of government? The group is, however, opposed to the push by a section of the political players to create new positions in the governance structure, saying it aims at serving partisan interests. They pointed out the Constitution's 10-year anniversary offers an opportunity for the country to reflect objectively on the progress and gains eroded. At the same time, the clergy raised concern over the alleged misappropriation of COVID-19 funds, even as they loaded President Uhuru Kenyatta's directive on investigative agencies to speed up investigations into the alleged graft of the Kenya Medical Supplies Authority. Thank His Excellence the President for directing the reopening of places of worship in recognition of the pivotal role the church plays in providing spiritual nourishment and securing the spiritual destiny of our people. While we applaud the government for putting up a spirited fight against the pandemic, we are deeply concerned and seriously disturbed by reports of abuse of resources meant to combat the COVID-19 pandemic 
and other corruption related incidences that have been exposed are, and are in the public domain. The late, latest investigations of the substantial loss of millions, if not billions, that is alleged to have been looted has left all of us puzzled. This is an unfortunate situation that has serious consequences against the nation. They also faulted the Senate for their continued failure to approve a county revenue sharing formula calling for an end to the stalemate. We believe that every Kenyan deserves equal access to the national resources as a matter of right and justice. We urge our honorable senators to set aside their political grandstanding and give the country a solution to this unnecessary impasse. At the same time, they urge the national and county governments to fast track negotiations and address the plight of health workers who are in the front line battling the pandemic. The system of devolved services. We also urge for the establishment of a national health commission to continuously look into the affairs of our health workers and ensure that health services are not disrupted in this country. Reporting for Channel One News, I'm Jackie Wambiru. All right, remember we are going to answer some of the pertinent questions emerging from the constitutional journey in Kenya that uh, we started 10 years ago. Actually, this is the third constitution we are having since independence, a constitution that has uh, brought forth quite a number of changes in how the, in the going-ons of this particular country. Tonight, I will be engaging a panel of three in a bit. That is Ben Nyabira, a program manager, Katiba Institute, as well as Wilfred Muliro, he's a governance expert, and we'll also be engaging Anne-Marie Okutoi, a director of research advocacy and outreach at the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights. Most of the questions that have been raised, especially around this time, uh, that touch on how well we have done when it comes to the implementation of the Constitution. Also, looking at you know whether it, the time is ripe for us to be having uh, the, the talks to uh, amend this Constitution, whether we, knew, we need a new document altogether. These are some of the issues that we will be focusing on. Remember, it's coming at a time when there is that clamor for constitutional reforms that has been brought forth, courtesy of the Building Bridges Initiative that was birthed by uh, the handshake between President Uhuru Kenyatta and opposition leader Raila Odinga. So a lot of issues are emerging right now, but of course there is so much to celebrate about the 2010 Constitution because it is a document that actually uh, saw us transition into a devolved system of govern governance. Uh, if you look at what people celebrate today, because this is actually one of the issues that has allowed Kenyans who are even in the remotest part of the country to have a taste of the national cake. So that is actually a conversation that we will be discussing in a bit. But remember, you can continue engaging us on social media at KBC Channel 1 at Safin underscore Aching and engage us by asking us all the questions you have with regards to the 2010 Constitution and even your expectations and whether you feel you are contented as a Kenyan with the, the manner in which we have implemented this particular document and what you think would have been done different in this particular journey, a journey that has taken us 10 years. Now, today marks exactly 10 years since Kenya chartered a new way uh, of constitutionalism, the introduction of the new constitution in 2010 has occasioned major reforms in the country, particularly in the political arena. After more than two decades, the new law ushered in a more decentralized political and governance structure that holds government accountable while ensuring it is responsive to the needs of the citizenry. Even though issues of concern still abound, the new system of governance is seen, as a many, uh, seen by many as a step in the right direction. And so tonight we take stock of the achievements and challenges recorded in the clamor to have a document that adapts to the country's emerging realities. All right, we'll be taking you through that particular journey right after this particular break. So do stay with us. We still have more on the other side.
KBC, in collaboration with the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development, is broadcasting enhanced out-of-class learning on radio, television, and online. Catch the lessons every weekday on KBC Channel 1 from 2 to 4 p.m. on KBC English Service and 15 FM from 9.15 a.m. to 5 p.m. and Radio Taifa from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. KBC English Service, Radio Taifa and 15 FM are also available countrywide on the free-to-air Signet digital TV platform or log on to www.kbc.co.ke for live streaming or download the KBC online app on Google Play Store. Kenya Broadcasting Corporation, ensuring learning no matter what. On the next episode of Corner. But the truth is, whether we go or choose to stay, doesn't change the reality. Toko katafute awa maklaun. Sahau mambo ya polisi. He lazima iwe street justice. Umelia ya kutosha. It does make me look like no. It is because deep inside your heart, unajua mambo ya julia yatakuwa sawa. I just want my baby to wake up. I want my baby back. Next on. Just, just the father. Leave. You too, leave. Oh, just. I said leave. I hope Sijeka Majani Moba Makiasi. Nama endo is here. You're really a special one. What are you doing here? Really, just. You're wasting your time. I'm not coming home. This is my father's house. Actually, it's Millicent's. Leave. You know you and dad have an issue to solve here. Be patient. Uh, be patient. Hey, Get ready for Kenya's greatest concert ever to celebrate our country at this time of crisis and fear. One stage, 30 artists. On Saturday, the 29th of August at 8 p.m. at All Saints Cathedral. Kenya Nietu, a concert of hope and victory. Sponsored by Stanbic Bank and supported by the Media Honors Association because we care for Kenya. The show will be live on yetulive.com, KISS TV, Citizen TV, K24, NTV, KTN, KBC, Switch TV, CAS TV, and TV47. Supported by Hot 96, Capital FM, Radio 44, Three Stones Media, and Family Media. Remember, it's this Saturday, 29th August at 8 p.m. Join us. Jumapili hii kwenye runinga ya KBC, ungana nae askofu Michael Wanderi, Wakanisa la Christian Foundation Fellowship Kiambu kuanzia saa moja hadi saa mbili asubuhi. Ningetaka ni kwambie our Jehovah God because the Bible says he is the same yesterday, today and forevermore. He is able to take you to a place of abundance. He is able to take you to Rehobothi in the name of Jesus Christ. Kipindi ni neno la neema ukiletewa naye askofu Michael Wanderi wa kanisa la Christian Foundation Fellowship Kiambu. Welcome back and thank you so much for staying with us now. Let's take you down memory lane. Today marks exactly 10 years since Kenya chartered a new path of constitutionalism. The introduction of a new constitution in 2010 
has occasioned major reforms in the country, particularly in the political arena. After more than two decades, the new law ushered in a more decentralized political and governance structure that holds government accountable while ensuring it is responsive to the needs of the citizenry. Even though issues of concern still abound, the new system of governance is seen by many as a step in the right direction. And so tonight we take stock of achievements and challenges recorded in the clamor to have a document that adapts the country's emerging realities. Since independence, Kenya has had three constitutions. Blurred for the last time, and Kenya ceased to be a colony. Immediately after the attainment of self rule, the country has been characterized by continued efforts to structure and restructure the political and governance systems. Push for a different model was driven by the need to address issues such as ethnicity, lack of sound structures, and weak institutions. These issues were considered a serious threat to the country's long term well being. The first constitution adopted at independence was drafted in London. An election was later conducted and the Kenya African National Union KANU won. A year later, the KANU administration would amend the constitution, establishing a presidential system. This later generated concerns amid claims that the then constitution had turned the KANU-led government into an autocratic regime. The struggle for democracy became even more persistent, and in the early 1990s, there was a consensus that the country needed a new set of rules. Amid both internal and external pressure, President Daniel Arap Moy bowed and allowed multi-party elections in 1992. I am glad to inform Kenyans that I have today ascended to the bill <laughs> as a sign of my commitment to political reform. Yet, even after this historic proclamation, there remained concerns that the amendments made on the Constitution then only served to strengthen the executive arm of government. The way we went about writing our Constitution, one, I must say that um, it took blood, sweat, tears, and lives. <coughs> Sorry lives of many people, Kenyans, to get a new constitution. It was not a walk in the park. It was, it was a fight. It, is a, it was a fight by the people, for the people, to have a new constitution that would uh, give a framework on how we are going to move on as a country. Efforts to reform the constitution were relaunched in the year 2000 with the creation of the Constitution of Kenya Review Commission. After broad public consultations, the commission produced a draft famously duped the bombers draft, named after the cultural center located in Nairobi where its drafting took place. To welcome you all to the formal inauguration of the National Constitution Conference here at the Bombers of Kenya. We are called upon to write a new proper constitution of the Republic of Kenya. So let us not quarrel over small matters. But sections of government were unhappy with the bombers' draft and successfully pushed for yet another draft constitution, the Wako draft, named after the then Attorney General Amos Wako. The NARC people who won Kibwaki and Wamalwa eh? uh, and Gilu and uh, Raila, they formed this coalition and they won. Uh, but they won on the basis of some understanding of who will get what <laughs> in terms of power. Yeah, hmm? yeah. Uh, it has very really little to do with the, the country, the who gets what. Once they, as soon as they were declared the winners and they were sworn in, now the winners started fighting. Hmm? The, the people in NAC started fighting. And that was the background to now the prolonged bombers' circus. 
the draft received parliamentary approval and was presented to Kenyans in a referendum held in 2005. The document was however rejected by Kenyans after successful campaigns by an alliance between opposition party Kanu and disgruntled members of government led by Raila Odinga. This marked the birth of the Orange Democratic Movement, ODM. The party went on to challenge Kibaki in the 2007 elections, whose aftermath led to chaos that left a number of Kenyans dead and thousands others displaced. <laughs> A peace deal brokered by former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan led to the formation of a grand coalition government. As part of the power sharing deal, the Kibaki and Raila Odinga coalition was expected to deliver a new constitution before another election could be held. A committee of experts led by renowned lawyer Nzamba Kitonga was established to lead the drafting of Kenya's new constitution. The committee sought the views of citizens, professional organizations, religious groups, Groups, special interest groups, civil society, academicians, amongst others, and factored them into the draft constitution that was then subjected to a referendum. Honored to report that we completed this task. Significantly, Kenyans are still almost equally divided on the system of government which they desire. While they remain unanimous that the powers of the, their chief executive must be curtailed and be subject to checks and balances. They continue to root for either a pure parliamentary system of government or a pure presidential system of government or a hybrid system of government. On the 4th of August 2010, Kenyans resoundingly voted to adopt a new constitution. promulgation ceremony at Wurupak three weeks later, President Mwai Kibaki signed the new constitution into law, signaling a fresh start. Kenyans were ecstatic. The new constitution had reduced executive power, devolved authority, and guaranteed rights to minority and marginalized groups. The people of Kenya have yearned for a new constitution which won guarantees peace, national unity, and integrity of the Republic of Kenya in order to safeguard the well-being of the people of Kenya. This constitution is very good and is very progressive. It's very transformative. It is very, very responsive to the needs of the people of this country. To a large extent, and in my own estimation, to almost over 75, 80%, this is a very good constitution. This constitution, first and foremost, is legitimate, is owned by the people of Kenya. So the sovereign power vests in the people of Kenya. To the extent that Kenyans participated in the writing of this constitution is wonderful, it's fantastic, it's good. Let me tell you that this constitution is the best constitution in the world. And if it were to be fully implemented, this world would change itself and be among the fast developing countries joining the club of developing countries. Look at the separation of powers between the three arms of government. Yeah. For the first time since independence, we have had a semblance of independence of the arms of government. We have seen a very robust uh, 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 and uh, bold judiciary that has come out and uh, said it as it is. But despite the promising aspects of the new constitution, serious concerns have been raised with regard to its implementation. It is one thing to have a document called the Constitution of the Republic of Kenya. But it's another issue to implement this document. Implementation. Now, the other day our Chief Justice rightly said that uh, a Constitution, if not implemented or if 
they have positions that people are not going to respect or whatever. It's a hollow document. It's hollow. Political class has done this country disservice because the intention of the 2010 constitution was to render office holders irrelevant and make the structures and institutions work. But by and large, institutions have been suffocated yeah, and have taken a, a personality uh, a, a kind of uh, phenomena. And rather than the institution working, uh, institutions are now known uh, by the holders of those offices. If you talk about is was never the intention of the 2010 uh, constitution because the constitution was meant to disabuse institutions of the faces that operate within them. These very issues have led to calls for amendments of the 2010 constitution through the now popular Building Bridges Initiative, born following a truce between President Uru Kenyatta and his political rival camp partner Raila Odinga of ODM. There was, there was, there was, a, there was, a, what I, would, I don't want to call it a lie, but there was this impression that uh, once we have a new constitution, then it's going to be a panacea. You know, it's going to be the alpha and omega, and it is going to be a solution to all our problems, which, of course, is true to an extent and is also not true to an extent. Now, to the extent that we were able to manage to rewrite our constitution, remember when this movement started, it was not about writing a new constitution. It was about constitutional change. One very clear thing is that our behavioral culture is extremely key in determining where Kenya goes. Unless we have fidelity to the Constitution, unless we have allegiance to the Constitution and the nation, we will get nowhere. The country's key political figures have since stressed the need to re-examine Kenya's style of politics for the country to make giant strides towards economic development. The head of state says this can only be done through a re-engineering of the country's constitution. But the crafters of this social contract also told us and reminded us that a constitution was a work in progress. And as such, we were made to adopt it with a promise that in the future we will make it better. Ten years later, the moment to improve on it, I believe, is now. While noting that a lot has been achieved since independence, the president says a moment has come to bring an end to the senseless cycles of violence experienced in every election. People should constantly reevaluate and debate the document. That does not mean that they should change every time they debate. But it's good to talk about it. The shortcomings, and there are many shortcomings, the positives. And uh, if there are some rough edges, the uh, pigum sasa. <laughs> Eric Biagon reporting for Channel One. News. All right. Thank you, Eric Biagon, for packaging that report that actually just explains to us how it was not easy for us to come up with this 2010 constitution. The journey has uh, had its ups and downs, and Kenyans were optimistic that uh, this uh, document was actually going to be the answer to some of the issues that were ailing the country at that particular time, as they witnessed its promulgation in 2010. A lot of uh, questions were really, ex they were hopeful that a lot of issues were going to be uh, addressed through the implementation of this constitution. But 10 years on, have their aspirations been met through this constitution? And of course, what do they think about the implementation process and even the clamor to have reforms in the constitution? Let's uh, listen in to some of the views of Kenyans tonight. Katiba, kwa miaka kumi kitu tumenufaika na hile imetusaidia tu ni ugatusi, yani devolution, kwa sababu imeleta watoto wetu wameandikuwa kasi Tunaona maendeleo inaendelea ingawaje kaunti zingine hazifanyi vizuri lakini it's good ziendelee kuwako 
lakini mheshimiwa Kibaki alipokuja alituongoza na hiyo katiba vizuri sana so it means katiba si shida katiba ni uongozi hii katiba pia kuna kipengele kikwa kinasema kwamba kutarekebi kutakuwa na marekebisho marekebisho pia imefika kwa sababu kila election tukienda watu wanapigana wanauana kwa sababu ya kiti moja wacha viti zikuwe kadhaa watu wagawane kuanzia juu ikiteremuka hakuna mtu atangangania ati lazima akuwe president mwingine atakuwa prime minister mwingine atakuwa deputy prime minister na mambo itaendelea mbele sababu gani sione kama inawak hiyo constitution ilikuwa inasema tutakaa na askari kwa pamoja na kusaidiana katika kila jambo lakini sasa naona ni kama askari bado wananyanyaza raia, raia tu na pia unakuta kwamba kuna freedom of expression zamani ungeliongea kidogo hivi ungelikujua mpaka kwa nyumba sasa saa hizi unakuta kwamba watu wanaji express vilivyo na wanasema vitu ambavyo viko ndani yao na hiyo ni njia moja hata ya kuondoa stress hii serikali haishughuliki lakini za, ya zamani hii ya saa hii wakisema wanaingia kwa bunge kujiongezea pesa inapitishwa kwa siku moja lakini kisemekana ni kitu ya wananchi ya kawaida haipitishwi madaktari bado wanagoma na tulipata katiba hatufaili kuwa tumefika kiwango hiyo democracy kwa wako wanasiasa mbali si kwa raia kama rais wetu wa Kenya Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta angependa kubadilisha katiba abadilisha katiba ambayo anajua ni ya kufaindi mwananchi iziwe kuwa ni ya kufaindi viongozi wenyewe na kuwa, na kuwapa manufaa makubwa tungependa hata mwananchi afaindike kwa ajili ya katiba na awache kufinyiriwa hii mambo ya kusema hii watu wengi wanataka kuinikilizi watu waweke viongozi wengi wapunguze kama women rep hatujui kazi yake Atujuai kazi yake atumuonagi ukianza kusema hii MCA si seneta hiyo watu ni wengi wanaharibu hiyo pesa hiyo pesa wangekaia watu wenye masinani huku wapate kitu kidogo kidogo hii katiba inakosa kuwak kwa sababu the people who are supposed to enforce the law are compromised by wale watu ambaye tunatuma watu represent as an organization and as people of Mombasa we feel that uh, the number of counties are too many and we should actually reduce them from 47 to 10 so for us we feel that uh, the burden on mwananchi is too huge for him to continue bearing the brunt of the cost of running these county governments and in honestly in all honesty we don't need 47 counties we don't need 47 governors 47 deputies 47 cabinets only 10 is enough and i think we can move on with this hata kwa That is just part of what Kenyans have to say today as we mark 10 years since we promulgated the 2010 constitution and now we want to dig deeper into this particular subject allow me now bring in my panelists uh, for the program into this particular broadcast and i told you earlier i will be engaging a panel of three and uh, it includes Ben Nyabira he is a program manager Katiba Institute and of course also Wilfred Muliro a governance expert they are with me in studio and uh, I'll be hosting Anne Marie Okutoi via Zoom she is a director research advocacy and outreach at the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights thank you so much gentlemen and lady for creating time for us tonight All right, we begin uh, straight away. I'll uh, start uh, with you uh, Ben Nyabira. Uh, just looking at uh, the Constitution of Kenya uh, 2010, a document that many have considered as uh, the most progressive document, not just locally but even internationally it's recognized as a document that is progressive. If you look at it, what do you think are some of the strong points in the 2010 Constitution? Uh, thank you so much and thank you for the opportunity. I think there is so much we can say that is good about the 2010 constitution. And uh with regard to whether those things are what we needed to achieve what we intended to solve with the constitution, uh, I think that will be a different question. But on whether the aspirations and the institutions uh and the regulation of our conduct that we have in the constitution uh is the right one i would say yeah it is the right one and uh we have so much that is good with the constitution uh for example uh based on our history we had uh so much 
uh, misgovernance uh, in our governance system. And as a result, we created so many oversight institutions uh, that were supposed to ensure that we have good governance in our country. So that is one thing that is a positive thing. But number two, we know that we have uh, provisions in the Constitution uh, that are supposed to ensure that all of us Kenyans have a culture of good values. Uh, chapter six of the Constitution, uh, and especially the leaders. Uh, because based on our history, uh, leaders didn't prove to have very good um, uh, leadership qualities, including integrity. And so I would pick at least those two points. First is the uh, leadership and integrity provisions in the Constitution, mm -hmm. uh, which we have, and also uh, the many provisions that are intended to ensure that there's adequate oversight on the uh, on, on our governance system. All right, I'd like a cocktail of responses uh, on this particular question. So Wilfred, I'll also bring you in. What is it that stands out for you about the 2010 Constitution, something that you celebrate as a Kenyan? <clears throat> Thank you very much uh, to have me here again. Uh, I would say this, that um, you know this Constitution uh, came about because of uh, not just uh, uh, abrupt uh, emergence from people, uh, an elitist group. It was based on a right moment that was driven by Kenyans. And you could see two things standing out very clearly. Uh, the first one was the idea of uh, devolution. How do we manage uh, the loopholes that were there uh, based on the session of paper that uh, uh, relied on the highland areas that would be able to have the ripple effects to the other. So there was that story of marginalized areas. And, you know, linked to that politically is the idea of this monster presidency. So everybody was saying the presidency is like a monster, too much power. So how do we find ways of uh, decentralizing power and sharing with other arms of government. And I think uh, it envisages that. So to me, it brings governance closer to the people. Mm -hmm. It uh, aspires uh, to achieve equity among societies in Kenya. All right. Uh, thank you so much for that. And Anne, uh, just uh, thank you so much once again, Anne, for creating time for us tonight. I'd like also for you to chip in and tell us, but with regards to uh, human rights, uh, this constitution came at a time when there were quite a number of issues we were facing as a country, citing even historical injustices and breach of human rights. If you look at how far we've come 10 years down the line and the promise that was enshrined in the 2010 constitution to address some of these issues, are you contented tonight? Thank you, Safin, um, for having me on this uh, uh, news bulletin. It's indeed a pleasure. And um, just to move straight to the issue of um, human rights, and, and I like the way we have taken uh, um, you know, a look and reflected at the journey that we had um, as a country. And it's important to emphasize that we had a history. We had a history that was not so rosy. We had a history that had its faces of, of you know, um, human rights violations that were the order of the day and repressive um, regimes. But then now when we promulgated um, the 2010 constitution was now the recognition of human rights as inherent to every human being, not a favor um, that the state um, um, gives you but it is an entitlement. And this was really one of the um, uh, main achievements or rather one of the gains of the 2010 constitution that if you look at the previous constitution where human rights, uh, yes, would be mentioned, but they would be given on one hand and would be taken away by the other. We now had in the supreme law um, 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 very express provisions providing for these rights. So just that um, recognition of, of, of rights for all Monainchi was a big, big gain um, for us um, as Kenyans. But then also, and it has been mentioned about the oversight institutions, and, and this, the intention of these institutions really 
was to provide the necessary checks and balances so that we have state power that is regulated and we are moving power um, to the people as opposed to the state. Um, and you'll find that we have a whole um, you know, chapter, what we call chapter 15, um, commissions with various mandates that are supposed to oversight on various issues, including um, monitoring human rights. So this architecture itself and the recognition of human rights. As a commission, we reflect, um, you know, back what have we over the past decade, um, what have we gained in terms of human rights and the enjoyment of human rights? And listening carefully to the Kenyans, um, you'll find that the Kenyans still feel, um, uh, you know, that they don't really enjoy these rights. They don't, they don't enjoy the fruits of the constitution that they had so much hope for. But when you look at what we've been able to achieve um, over the past 10 decades with regards to human rights, you'll find that because of the express provisions of the constitution, um, we've been able to enact various legislations that now give um, light to certain human rights um, and fundamental freedoms. For instance, you'll find um, a, a legislation touching on the freedom from torture. You'll find a legislation obligating um, the state to um, make sure that every Kenyan has access to information. You'll find legislation protecting the freedom of the media, the freedom of association, among others. All right. Again, we look at, yes. All right. So we, we, we have had our gains um, over the past decade. But however, the implementation is what is lacking. Exactly. And that is now paving way for uh, the next uh, segment in this particular conversation. Because even from the views of Kenyans, when we were just watching earlier, you could tell their mixed reactions with regards uh, to how we have implemented this particular document that from what all of you are describing tonight actually contained a beautiful vision for our country. And Wilfred, I don't know what, you, what words you'd use to describe our success rate when it comes to the implementation of the 2010 Constitution. Should we be celebrating that we've done a good job or should we call ourselves in a meeting and actually just ask how faithful we have been in the implementation process? I think, uh, Safil, I'll begin by thanking Kenyans. You know, they are resilient. They have been, their hopes, we were very hopeful in 2010, uh, August uh, 27, that uh, now we have a document that will serve us. But coming to implementation, I think that is now the disease that does not arise from the Constitution, I think arises from those uh, responsible for implementation, and that is uh, the government of the Republic of Kenya. So in my own opinion, uh, to me, I think the biggest or the weakest link in this uh, celebration that we are looking at uh, since uh, 2010 mm -hmm. is the implementation of this constitution. If I were to rate it, maybe in class somewhere, I would give those who are uh, given this um, prerogative of implementing, maybe three out of 10. <laughs> really, three out of 10? <laughs> that is not a very good, if you ask me. But uh, maybe one would ask, is it, is it deliberate? Or was circumstances not allowing us as a country to implement the 2010 constitution? What is the problem, really? I would say this, that um, uh, two things. One, and even you can see the glamour for, for change, is the usual politics that uh, we look at, uh, we are looking at the constitution in terms of political expedience as if maybe we'll live forever. And the second issue is uh, I, I would like to slightly uh, maybe press my finger on the other uh, panelists those within the institutions. The other issue is those independent institutions where we had the highest hopes, you know, that they'll help, especially oversight and even uh, implementation. Over time, they have now declined in their visibility. And even now, as citizens, we don't know uh, what their role is in terms of uh, pushing the republic, the government, to see it that uh, the implementation of the constitution is up to the end. 
Because for instance, the, the Kenyan National Commission for Human Rights, uh, at this time maybe, I'm very interested you know, in politics, I follow what happens, but I'll not be able to mention the, the past two chairpersons of that commission. Mm -hmm. I can only remember Maina Kiai, because at that time there was some form of independence. And I think it's not the problem of the people within there, is the executive has stretched its hand so they are selecting who will be the ombudsperson, who will be in charge of that, who will run the Kenya Commission for Human Rights. So all these commissions are now, again, just like parliament, kneeling before the executive to mm -hmm. see what they can be allocated So, So, so Wilfred, if I, if I get you clearly, you're saying such uh, institutions um, probably failed by not being as present and as aggressive, as effective as was expected? Exactly. We uh, are not seeing that. The good thing is that Anne, Anne is with us. So Anne, probably before I move to the next question, you'd like to respond to that. Wilfred is raising a concern about the level of effectiveness uh, of uh, institutions like the one that uh, you work with, the Kenya National uh, Commission on Human Rights. Probably you'd like to expound on you know, what you have done from your part to help us in this journey of reali realizing the implementation of the Constitution and um, thank you so much, Safin, um, and, and Wilfred for those comments. And maybe just to start us off is, um, is just to say that um, the independent um, institutions and um, the constitutional commissions that have been put um, you know, by the Katiba, if you take a critical look at what, um, for instance, the Human Rights Commission has been able to achieve over the past decade, it has um, led to a lot of positive, um, um, uh, you know, uh, impact in terms of human rights. And I'll just start off by mentioning, um, uh, for instance, um, the discrimination element in terms of certain groups in society that have historically been forgotten. And because of the work of organizations um, like the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights, among other actors, these groups are now beginning to be recognized as equal on their own accord. And I'll just mention one or two. For instance, um, uh, the intersex persons. It was because of the advocacy um, of the commission taking these cases to court because of the violations that these intersex persons have historically faced for the first time in the just concluded um, uh, census, or rather the census that was carried out last year, for the first time in history, the intersex persons were now recognized as a, as a third sex. And this is the kind of, of, of impact that oversight institutions like the commission have. And I'll just mention one other, that uh, the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights has you know, undertaken a lot of interventions in terms of protecting the rights of prisoners. And for the first time in 2017, you'll realize that during the elections, prisoners were allowed to vote, even amidst challenges that was a step towards the right direction. Right, so, um, and if you look again at um, a lot of um, um, the legal framework and the jurisprudence that emanates from our courts, you'll realize that institutions like the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights has actually moved to court to defend a lot of those violations that continue um, happening. You'll, you'll see the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights strongly um, um, you know, condemning police brutality during elections. All right, and this kind of documentation, um, this kind of redress, um, this kind of public interest um, litigation is what the cons the constitution um, you know aspired to. However, right. I must mention this. Sorry, sorry, and um, allow me allow me to cut you short, uh, in the interest of time. Uh, but then again, uh, you, you, you're really bringing out some of the uh, you know, efforts that uh, you have put in place as a commission to uh, move forward the human rights in the country. But then also, you know, just exploring the constitution further. Allow me to bring Ben into uh, this conversation as well. Ben, you know, earlier Wilfred rated us at three out of seven, uh, you know, when it comes to implementation of the constitution. Probably, mm -hmm. let's look at the other side of the coin. What are some of the missed opportunities uh, if you look at how we have implemented this document what is it that probably um, was promised and it is a promise that has not been delivered to Kenyans till date uh, 
Thank you so much. So I think one of the missed opportunities is the goodwill that Kenyans have towards devolution. Uh, we have had since 2013 the divorce system of government, and as a result, we know that uh, quite a big chunk of money has gone to the counties. Uh, but then we also know that not all counties, uh, for example, are experiencing uh, good development in their counties. Uh, some, for good reasons that we know, some of them are uh, because of corruption uh, and, and such like activities. So I think the goodwill that Kenyans have towards devolution, um, many Kenyans are willing to participate in the divorce system of government. They want to see it succeed. But then we also know that many leaders in those counties have not done very well in ensuring that uh, they uh, you know, meet the mandate as is required. Mm -hmm. So I think that is one, um, that is one main um, uh, opportunity that we've lost. But number two, as I said, this constitution created so many institutions. Uh, there are so many. It's very difficult to list and finish them so fast. But then we know that in parliament, for example, we, create, we added another you know, <laughs> parliament house, that is the Senate. Uh, we know that we added the number of MPs. We even uh, included the two the agenda principle. We know that we have at least 15 commissions. Mm -hmm. All this was supposed to ensure All right. that the executive is accountable. But then I'm not sure if many Kenyans would agree that uh, we've achieved significant progress in that respect. Okay, Ben. Yeah. Uh, uh, allow me now, you know, just uh, probe all of you on whether it, the time is ripe for us to have a new document or go back and relook at how well we have done when it comes to its implementation. We are having this conversation at a time when there is an ongoing clamor for constitutional change. Ten years after the promulgation of the 2010 Constitution, as we wrap up this conversation, Wilfred, do you think this is a step in the right direction? And if we are to go that direction, what are some of the issues that ought to inform the conversations we ought to be having and even what are the changes that we ought to be having in this particular new uh, constitution? Uh, I would say this, that um, before I even answer whether it is in the right direction, <coughs> if you look at historically, you'll see that uh, when President Moy accepted to, to remove Section 2A, there was genuine pressure that the wind of change for multi-party was blowing across the entire globe. Come 2010, where Kenya had gone through a crisis, there was a pertinent uh, reason for change. But today, even listening to the president's address, I was unable to see, you know, he could not pinpoint clearly the reasons why we should change the constitution. It was a general statement. So in my view, unless we are convinced, because I belong to the people, I do not know why the political class is calling uh, for this uh, review or change or amendment of the constitution at this time, when they are not telling us what is this gap, where is the failure that can be pointed to the constitution mm -hmm. and not implementation. All right. And uh, your final words <coughs> on the same issue, is time ripe for us to have uh, constitutional reforms? I think, Safin, um, from the Commission's point of view, um, I would caution, um, you know, any talk around um, um, tampering with the Constitution before full implementation. We have not tested the fruits yet fully to be able to say that now we need changes. And we should really guard, we should jealously guard the gains that we have such that um, um, any narrative on the change of the constitution should be um, to the best interest of the citizens. But rather, Safin, we should be looking at how, how do we strengthen the institutions how do we take the power back to the people? How do we empower the people so that they know what their rights are and they can be able to you know, demand for accountability? They can be able to vote wisely. So I think, um, uh, you know, for me, if you ask me, let us first implement the constitution. Let us make our institutions work. Let us fund them so that they are able to effectively carry out their mandate. Let us address 
the issues that touch the common wananchi, the what we call the economic, social, and cultural rights that we mm -hmm. still haven't. All so right. for me, let us focus on implementation of the constitution. All right, Ben, uh, which side of the coin are you on? Should mm -hmm. we change the constitution or not? Um, some of the reasons that make us say uh, or ask ourselves whether there is need to change the constitution uh, include problems such as corruption, uh, problems such as uh, lack of integrity in leadership, uh, lack of you know performing by the leaders, um, such like problems, uh, lack of inclusion by leaders that we have, the leaders that we have, and the question is, is it because of the constitution? that um, you know the text of the constitution that we have we still have those problems does the constitution for example tell us how allow people to engage in corruption does the constitution allow people uh, not to be more inclusive does the constitution allow us uh, what other problem do we intend to address all those problems none of them uh, is because of the text of the constitution and mm -hmm. so I don't think if we intend to address the problems that we are currently facing, I don't think that the solution is in changing the, the text of the Constitution. However, uh, without contradicting myself, uh, we also create the Constitution in order to regulate the conduct of people. If the argument is to say, for example, that the system that we have creates um, you know, competitive elections, and so that maybe we need to remove the presidency uh, during general elections so that there is no, you know, the competitiveness that we witness during presidential elections. That can be an argument that can hold. But then right. if then there is to be an argument towards change of the constitution, it has mm -hmm. to be uh, sound. It has to be argued properly. All yeah. right, thank you so much, Ben Nyabira. Program Manager Katiba Institute. I was also engaging Wilfred Muliro, a governance expert. And on Zoom, we were joined by Anne Marie Okutoi. Uh, she's a director, research advocacy and outreach at the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights. Thank you so much, gentlemen and lady, for creating time for us. We are now going to be taking a very short break right here on KBC News Hour. We are coming back on the other side. There is more, including business news brought to you by. Regina Manyara. This Saturday, watch the Sabbath day service live from Nairobi Central SDA Church starting from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m on KBC Channel One. are the golden rules of living if you open it close it if you turn it on turn it off if you unlock it lock it up if you break it admit it if you can't fix it call in someone who can if you borrow it return it to get golden rules of life bonyeza star 811 star 397 hash Dial star 811 star 397 hash. This weekend on KBC Channel 1. All right, is that you? It's me. The number of women killed is not 375. The real number is probably closer to 5,000. 5,000. Some girl escaped. This girl was attacked, strangled, buried, and left for dead. And she crawled out of her own grave. She wants to find the guys who did this. I will not let anything happen to you. And I will find this man. But this is an important story. 
your story is destroy her. And they will kill you. Choose to read their Bible daily. They become wiser and they become stronger than the people who don't read their Bibles. So when you choose hard, difficult things, you become a natural leader. He brings us to church to introduce to us another higher level of relationship that is called a faith relationship. You are also a solution to somebody else's problem. You cannot be the only problem all the time. Join Pastor Jimmy Masharia on the Master's Touch this Sunday from 8 a.m. on KBC Channel 1. Thank you very much for still keeping us company on KBC Channel 1. Now we shift a focus from matters of the Constitution 10 years on and we focus on matters business tonight. I'm Regina Manyara. Now the government has outlined seven conditions that second-hand cloth importers have to meet before resuming business. Now among the conditions reached between President Uhuru Kenyatta and the Mitumba Association of Kenya during a meeting held at State House in Nairobi on Thursday is raising the maximum weight of a packed bill from the current 30 kilograms to 50 kilograms. All traders will also have to register with the Kenya Bureau of Standards. For the prohibition placed on importation of second-hand clothes was lifted a fortnight ago. The government has tightened protocols to ensure clothes are safe at a time when all efforts are being focused on controlling the spread of coronavirus from one region to the other. Thursday, President Uhuru Kenyatta received a petition from Mitumba traders highlighting the challenges they are experiencing as a result of the country's COVID-19 containment protocols. Tunataka kufanya biashara zetu. Tukitumia fikira mpia, fikira ya kusema, nitafanya biashara yangu kwa njia gani, bado nikijikinga mimi, na nikinge mteja wangu, asije, akapata virusi vya, corona. Mitumba traders now have to meet seven requirements, among them obtaining shipment fumigation certificates and complying with health protocols. And they have agreed that they will ensure that all the goods they import will be fumigated before they uh, in compliance with the directives from the Ministry of Health and they will fumigate before bailing in compliance with these standards. The traders have also been tasked with ensuring that prohibited items are not shipped in by instituting necessary sorting and categorization mechanisms before bailing. Importers are also required to obtain certificates of conformity from CAB's contracted agents in the country of origin before importation. It's bearing in mind that we are living in a different world. It is not the same world we came from. This is, this is a different world. And we must do our business. Lazima tufanya biashara zetu bearing that in mind. For ease of contact tracing and tax compliance, importers and wholesalers of Mitumba are required to submit to KRA and CABS a register of their first at year customers. CABS and KRA have also been given the leeway to undertake random inspections to ensure compliance with relevant laws and take appropriate action in accordance with the law. Seemingly a reprieve there from Mitumba traders. Now, Embu County is set to receive 333 million shillings from the National Agricultural and Rural Inclusive Growth Project to start agricultural projects in the area. Agriculture Cabinet Secretary Peter Munoz says part of the cash will finance construction of Rupinganzi Water Irrigation Project at a cost of 250 million shillings. Embu County is set to receive part of its share of the 22.6 billion shillings World Bank funded National Agricultural and Rural Inclusive Growth Project. The county will initially receive 333 million shillings 
that agriculture cabinet secretary Peter Munya says will raise to 1.5 billion shillings. Hii murandi iko na mambo ya vikundi. Hizo micro projects ambao wanapewa grants wakuwa trade wafanya biashara. Pia iko na eh, na mipango ya kusaidia cooperatives ambao pia wamepewa pesa yao. A big chunk of the cash will be used for construction of water projects in the area. Watu wapate maji ambao itawatoshelesha na ambao itakaa kwa muda mrefu ikiwatumikia. The projects are on dairy poultry and green gram farming in the lower region of Embu County that receives minimal rains. You see, ni me pokea na mtu ambaye anatengeleza cakes kule na ropi anataka mayai mingi sana and uh, now we can have the market after this project. 45 million shillings has been set aside to start a mira sako in the region to help farmers diversify to other crops. The president ya lituambia tutengeneze sako sa wakulima wale wa traders wa mirandi waweze kufanya mambo mengine waweze ku diversify kutoka kwa mirao wafanye mambo mengine Embu County is among 21 high agricultural potential counties set to benefit from the World Bank funded program Benson Diopa reporting for Channel 1 Business Now from Embu County the controller of budget has called for an urgent audit of COVID-19 funds allocated to county governments from March to the end of July this year Now the budget officers out of the 13.1 billion shillings allocated to counties to deal with the pandemic only 3.4 billion shillings has been utilized seven counties among them Nairobi, Marsabit and Kirinyaga did not spend any penny of the allocated COVID-19 funds When Kenya reported its first case of COVID-19 panic gripped the nation with the government scrambling for funds to boost the health sector in the country Through internal and external resources The National Treasury set aside 5 billion shillings for the setting up of isolation and quarantine centers in anticipation of a possible surge in positive cases. Another 2.3 billion shillings was set aside for health workers and allowances as well as hiring of extra health workers. The devolved units were planning to spend 5.4 billion shillings for purchasing of personal protective gears. However, despite the pandemic stretching health facilities at the counties to their limit, Most of the budgeted resources have remained unspent with the devolved units returning 9.7 billion shillings to the national treasury. The controller of budget blames the poor absorption rate on late disbursements of the funds with the national treasury releasing the funds on the 30th of June and 31st of July this year when most counties had closed their 2019-2020 fiscal year books. The highest spenders were Nakuru with 312 million shillings, Wajir at 255 million shillings, while Kembu County spent 246 million shillings to deal with the pandemic. Nairobi, Bomet, Embu, Kirinyaga, Lamu, Mandera and Marsabit did not spend a penny of the COVID-19 funds. The counties of Lamu, Tana River and Taita Taveta were the lowest spenders with 38, 71 and 76.8 million shillings respectively. Contributed to the low absorption of the funds. O'Brien came for business insight. Now the annual humpback whale migration has begun in the Indian Ocean with tourists encouraged to visit Watamu for a watching expedition. Now the playful whales migrate from Antarctica to warmer waters in the Indian Ocean congregating in the Kenyan waters between July and September to clave and breed. In this week's edition of Magical Scene, Irene Mchuma Odim highlights the annual humpback whale migration. is the season yes the humpback whales are in kenyan waters having moved from antarctica in a journey of about 25,000 kilometers while on transit the whales don't feed they instead survive on fats accumulated over the months from the food they eat Though there are less spectators in Watamu owing to the COVID-19 pandemic, the whales are not disappointing. Watamu ni wanyama wanaopatikana sehemu ya mbali kidogo na unatakiwa lazima uwe na boti ambayo kidogo iko na uzima wa kisawasawa. Boti ambayo imetengenezwa na fiberglass na iko kisawasawa. 
Compared to other years, the World Serve in 2020 turned up in numbers, in families and in magical groups. Ni mchezo mwingine ambao ni mzuri sana. Wageni wao wanafurahia sababu yule mnyama ni mnyama ambaye anavutia. Sasa zingine huwa na watoto wanaruka wana, wana pamoja. Sasa zingine huwa wana kama wako kwa msafara kama harusi. Naona huwa wanavutia sana watalii na watu wetu hapa nchini. Humpback whales are known for being the most acrobatic among the whale species. They leap from the water, showing off their giant bodies in play, dance, and even get rid of unwanted parasites from their bodies. But while watching is a waiting game. It can take a whole day at the sea for you to spot or miss out on a glimpse of the serenaders, especially if they sing to attract the opposite ni lazima kidogo uweze kuvumilia kwa sababu si bahari ambayo imetulia vile lakini ni ujipange yani kiufupi ni kama unaenda mbuga kuangalia wanyama tu ujipange namna hiyo ukweli sasa ndio immigration yao wanapitia sasa ndio muda huo lakini si bahari kwamba imetulia sana vile kwa hivyo wale ambao wanajiandaa kwenda ni wajiandae wajifunge kisawa sawa kutokana pengine wasikue ni watu wakuwa na sisi kia haraka ni waweze kuwa na uvumilivu wa bahari kidogo ama humpback whales tunakuwa na spams tunakuwa na mapilot lakini a type kama pilot whale ama spams wale si mara nyingi kwaona pilot whale wanapatikana maili nyingi kimbali sana lakini uzuri wa humpback whales hawa ndo tunawapata karibu sababu immigration yao wanapitia karibu karibu na coast kuna sehemu fulani ambazo ni vituo vya samaki huwa wana wanapatalishe kubwa kwa hivyo wao mara nyingi watu nawapata katika hizo sehemu ambazo ni vituo vya the whales move to Kenya in search of warmer waters to feed and breed. The babies will be drinking 200 liters of milk per day from their mothers. Milk that will free them up to back their journey back to Antarctica. The tourism ministry is spearheading efforts to market the sea and land migration between July and September involving the whales and wildebeest respectively for visitors to maximize the holiday opportunities and position Kenya as a preferred tourist destination. Irene Uchuma Odim, Matko Sense in the county of Kilifi. Get ready for Kenya's greatest concert ever to celebrate our country at this time of crisis and fear. One stage, 30 artists. On Saturday, the 29th of August at 8 p.m. at All Saints Cathedral. Kenya Nietu, a concert of hope and victory. Sponsored by Stanbic Bank and supported by the Media Honors Association because we care for Kenya. The show will be live on yetolive.com, KISS TV, Citizen TV, K24, NTV, KTN, KBC, Switch TV, CAST TV, and TV47. Supported by Hot 96, Capital FM, Radio 44, Three Stones Media, and Family Media. Remember, it's this Saturday, 29th August at 8 p.m. Join us. It's now time for us to focus on uh, some sports uh, news. Reigning Olympic 1500 meters champion Faith Kipiegon.
has set her sights on breaking their 1,000 meters world record at the Memorial Van Dam Diamond League meeting in Brussels on the 4th of September. Kipiegon, who came up 0.17 seconds shy of Svelana Mastakova's 2 minutes, 28.98 seconds world record at the Diamond League meeting in Monaco earlier this month, will give it another try in the same stadium and meeting where the record was set in 1996. Organizers have also announced that Bridget Kosgei, the world record holder in marathon, will also compete in Brussels together with the double world champion Sifan Hassan. Kosgei, who smashed the marathon world record in a stunning two hours, 14.04 seconds, ran in uh, Chicago last year, will be marking her track debut. Local restrictions due to the coronavirus pandemic have forced the meeting to be held behind closed doors. And Football Kenya Federation's electoral board today began verification of nomination uh, papers presented to them by those seeking elective positions at the county level in the upcoming elections. The process, which shall also continue tomorrow, will culminate in the publishing of preliminary list of county candidates on Saturday, August 29th, 2020. Football Kenya Federation's electoral board finalized its county nomination exercise yesterday, setting the scene for the county elections slated for 19th September. The last day of the exercise saw aspirants from Narok, Vihiga, Kakamega and Kisumu counties present their nomination forms a day after their counterparts from Nairobi East, West Pokot, Mombasa, Taita Taveta, Laikipia, Narok, Migori and Transoye appeared before the board. I know that unity is strength. We need to maintain FKF. If there are mistakes, we correct. And that is why we want to come in. If there are any mistakes, we correct from inside. Otherwise, when you start splitting everything, then you, football will die eventually. You shall not have any football. If I start coming up with my own thing, how far will it go? And how will it be recognized? Why do I do FKF is recognized. We need our fans also to, to enjoy what, what the people in Nairobi, the people in other regions are enjoying. So I'm very optimistic about the elections that uh, I'll be given a chance to become the secretary and uh, to ensure that we run or so can take it to the next level. The board has now kicked off the verification process after which it is expected to publish a preliminary list of county candidates on Saturday. A national executive committee and presidential aspirants are in the meantime expected to present their papers on August 31st with the national elections being held on October 17th, 2020. Former Federation boss Sam Nyamwea, Nicholas Musonye and Herbert Mochiro are among the candidates hopeful of unseating incumbent President Nick Mwendo come October, with the latter seeking a second four-year term. And Manchester United midfielder Paul Pogba has tested positive for coronavirus. The 27-year-old will have to self-isolate for 14 days. He will miss France's Nations League game in Sweden on Saturday, 5th September, and the home game against Croatia three days later. However, Pogba could be eligible for selection for United's Premier League opener against Crystal Palace at Old Trafford on the 19th of September. Meanwhile, Arsenal and Liverpool will be raising the curtain on the highly anticipated season with African superstars Mohamed Salah and Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang going head-to-head -head in the FA Community Shield on Saturday and televised by DSTV. All right, and that is that uh, the match that we had for you tonight. We appreciate your company as we were letting you in on how Kenya marked the 10th anniversary since the promulgation of the 2010 Constitution. Thank you so much for creating time for us tonight. My name is Safin Achieng Oma, and I was doing this together with <laughs> Regina Manyara. We totally appreciate Samuel Moiro as well as uh, Honorable Steve and Kagel who kept us, you know, kept up with us uh, during this evening. Well, we wish you a great uh, night and a good morning, sure, tomorrow.
Good evening and a very warm welcome to Channel 1 with the updates. My name is Irene Uchuma Odim. Tonight, Narok Town is the coldest. Temperatures turn at 10 degrees Celsius. Tomorrow, the sun will rise earliest at 6.21 a.m. And that will be from the county of Mombasa. But before we get into the details on that, let's establish what is happening in the country tonight. And there are scattered wet conditions in the county of Nairobi and counties around the region. The Lake Basin region is experiencing showers accompanied by thunderstorms over a few places. The northwestern is experiencing scattered wet conditions. And that is how the night will be as the rest of the country is covered with partly cloudy conditions. Tomorrow, we'll wake up to a cool and cloudy day here in the capital. Similar weather conditions will prevail in Meru and Nyeri. There will be scattered conditions at the coastal strip. Sunny conditions will dominate the northeastern parts of the country. There will be rains of a few places over the northwestern parts of the country and a few areas over the Lake Basin region as much as cloudy conditions will prevail during the early morning hours in western parts of the country. Sunny conditions will also dominate the region and these will change during the afternoon hours. We'll see an increase of wet conditions over the region and these will be showers accompanied by thunderstorms which will also stretch to a few areas over the northwestern parts of the country. The northeastern will mainly be sunny. The coastal strip will be sunny during the afternoon hours. The best time for you to spend the time at the beach. The southeastern lowlands will also be sunny. There will be cloudy, wet, cloudy conditions in the capital during the afternoon hours, but then sunny intervals will also prevail. There will be showers of a few places in Meru and Nyeri during the afternoon hours. Temperatures are still going up. In Lodo, we're expecting highs of 36 degrees Celsius. Mandera will also experience highs of 36 degrees Celsius. The capital will be a bit warm compared to previous days. Highs of 24 and lows of 15 degrees Celsius. And on that note, let's now cross the borders and have a look at the international forecast. Do have a good night and see you tomorrow. God willing.